I'm amazed how many people own stocks. I'm amazed how many people own stocks. Okay, next up, quickly, I just want to talk about the introduction of FX conversion fees from Trading212. This has annoyed me. Most of the Trading212 stuff that comes out doesn't really annoy me, but this does. Because now every time I buy something in America, I'm going to lose 0.15% on all of my trades. We're calling it a fee. We're calling it a 0.15% FX fee, not commission. And I suppose that will be based on your own interpretation of what you think a fee is versus what you think a commission is. Hmm. And this fee is on practically everything. It's on buying a US stock. It's on selling a US stock. It's on dividends that you get and dividends that you reinvest. Dividends is a big part of my strategy. And I need to now understand how much I'm going to be charged and whether it is just me worth going to Vanguard and taking the 0.07 charges on there. Because one of the main reasons why I'm on Trading212 is because the fees are cheaper than ETFs. I think the first hurdle you've got to try and get past is what you think of the morality of this company. Because that's not what a business is. A business is designed to make money. And for clarity, as a customer, we should also not be emotionally attached to anything either. Businesses are there to make money and get as much money out of you as they can. And likewise, you should be making a decision to decide which business is best for you. You shouldn't be picking your trading platform based on who has the best colors or who gives you the free shares or whatever. And when I'm picking a trading platform, I need to figure out which is the best business for me and which one is gonna save me the most money. By breaking this fee barrier, it now makes me think I have to go out and look for other platforms. It turns out 0.15% isn't that bad. Free Trade is charging 0.45%. And Hargreaves Lansdowne is charging 1%. And if you go to a bank, it can be as much as 2, 2.5%. Two I checked. The only one left that doesn't seem to do FX feeds is apparently Stake. And it looks like the CEO of Stake wasted no time in going on the attack. Stake is one I've never really looked at, to be honest. It looks exactly like all the others. Wait a second. This is just trading 212's website, but black and white. Sorry, I'm just having a bit of an Illuminati moment here, but I'm guessing there's just some AWS website or AWS model out there that just makes the same website for everyone. And it also looks like it wants to make itself clear there that it only charges FX fees on transfers and not on trades. So I'm guessing inside stake, you actually have to convert to uh, US dollars before you can buy something in US. That makes a lot more sense, I think. Still, you're getting charged 0.5% on all your money, so it looks like it compares pretty similar. Anyway, I got a bit sidetracked there, but it looks like Stake is the only one now that looks like it can compare to Trading212. But even then, Trading212's fees look pretty small. But this is the problem, right? This is the problem with Trading212. It's taking and taking a little bit more every month by the looks of things. The question, I guess, is where does it stop? And that's where you've got to consider with this business. I'm not saying you want to trust Trading212 because I wouldn't trust Free Trade. I wouldn't trust Hargreaves Lansdan. I wouldn't trust fucking Stake either. Remember, this is a dog-eat-dog -dog world. This is the corporate world now. You're investing in companies. Some of the companies that you invest in kill people regularly. Remember that. Trading 212 is just another business. Don't get too emotionally involved. Step back, do your research, and figure out what the cheapest is. Right now, it does still look like Trading 212. But I wonder if there is a system coming from Trading 212 that is designed to trap you. Trading212 want your money because they don't make a lot of it from the share dealing. I admit, they do have to make money somehow, but this does feel a little slimy. To come at it logically with no emotional attachment, and remember, what we've got to do when we're investing, we've got to just stay away from emotion. We need to always not be emotional when the markets are selling off. We need to invest in companies based on their fundamentals, and we need to now decide on our trading broker based on exactly who's giving you the best deal. Looking down the list and what everybody else charges, Trading212 currently are still giving the best deal. And that I think is as far as I can go with this one because I don't want to push anyone in either direction emotionally because I think that would be morally wrong. 
My level of trust in Trading 212 extends to how good their business is, if they're making money, and whether they're giving me the best deal. That's as far as I'm going. And I think with investing in general, that is the way you should be playing things. Speaking of emotions, uh, global stocks tumble as rising bond yields worry investors. Let me try and explain this one quickly. Apparently, the reason why stocks are going up so much is because there's no other alternative. And in the same way, treasury bonds and gilts, which used to be the main alternative, also don't give you a very good rate. And this increase is making some investors think that they should be pulling out their money and getting ready to put it back into bonds. You can put your money into a 10 year treasury for 10 years and you will almost certainly gain 1.5% out of it. And three years ago, you could get 3% out of it. A lot of people love a 3% rise or a 3% dividend. But imagine if that dividend at 3% was completely safe. You could argue that it would be much safer to put your house deposit into a 3% bond rather than YOLOing it into Tesla. And going back to like 2008, it was 5%. Now, if it was 5%, even I'd be considering putting my money in there. And what's happening with this 10-year treasury bond is this yield is starting to look interesting to some people. If this yield crosses 2%, you can argue that it might keep up with inflation. This then becomes essentially a risk-free asset. And that's caused these big dips in the market. How much has Tesla gone down by the month? Oh my God, 10% a day? Ooh. Jesus, if it comes down to $274, even I might consider it. But it looks like it's going to get held somewhere here about $408, isn't it? There's no way I'm going to say I told you so yet because the bull trap's still yet to come. Sorry, Tesla investors. How much are you down on the 34% down on the month? Whoa. Oh, my lordy. Okay, but this treasury yield and this little mini correction that we're having at the moment is not going to phase me. You know why? Because I've got companies in here that I know are still undervalued and I'm happy to put in. And I want to fill my ISA. That was my goal. My goal for this year was to be able to fill my ISA. And today, I've got £1,600 to load into this market. I just don't know where because I don't know where the value has gone today. Unilever is going to be my first one to put into. I think it's had a pretty rough time recently. And Unilever often trades along its normal P line of 19.63. Unilever is a largely popular safe stock it could easily come down to here if we look over the history um unilever will sometimes on big crashes in 2008 will come right below its uh, peg ratio line but other than that and 2000 it's generally traded at a premium and right now it's trading at a pe of 17 so i think it's a good time to put some money into this stock so let's just buy uh five shares of Unilever review send. Five shares gone. Next up, I bought it the other day and I'm going to buy it again, Broadcom. Trading well below its cash flow line and actually under its normal PE ratio as well. I even think this company is underrated on its qualitative as well. It's got a lot of exposure to Apple, but I do think the semiconductor industry is going to have a big raw soon. The semiconductor shortage is only going to raise prices and I believe that Broadcom is aiming to get into automobiles as well. If Broadcom does open up the automobile market, that's going to be a big game changer for them. I think Broadcom has a lot to come. I think it's going to be one of the next fang stocks. I really do. Straight in there today, probably still going to go down, but we're in the crash. We're not trying to time the market, remember. I'm doing everything as I say. I'm dollar cost averaging in. It's the first of the month. It's time for me to buy. Crash or no crash. I personally want to continue reinvesting into the market as often as I can and as consistently as I can, regardless of any crappy tech crash. The only time I personally do diverge away from the traditional dollar cost averaging type thing or the pound cost averaging. I just call it cost averaging. It's going to be fucking Bitcoin averaging one day. But the most important thing to me right now is that I want to buy some of these companies at good value. Digital Realty, I just wanted to mention here because Digital Realty is killing me. I want Digital Realty to stay here for you and for me as a message to say, do not buy companies that are stupidly overvalued. This company has now eaten a thousand pound of my money and it's going to stay in there. I think digital realty long term will go very, very well. But I do think over the next three years, I've really 
doffed up my averages here. I think I have put myself at risk of losing 2.4% a year for the next three years on digital realty. However, maybe in the future, 10 years later, maybe I'll start to see some of that money come back to me. I'm not going to buy any more today though. Ugh. Bristol Myers Squibb is my next one. I don't really have to explain this one. This company has been flat for ages and that's not a bad thing. We're dividend investing here. We're trying to accumulate at lower levels. I try to think of it this way. The longer your stocks stay low, the more of them you can accumulate. I don't have a couple of billion that I can just go and blow on Verizon one day. I have to gradually build these stakes up. If I found a high growth company and I went and put 300 quid in and then two weeks later it went up 400%, I can't put more money in it. So some of these companies, I'm very happy for them to stay low for the short term. Over the long term, I'd like to see them growing with their earnings. I'd like to see them growing with their free cash flow. And Bristol Myers Squibb, I think is going to be one of them. So today, let's add £215 worth of Bristol Myers. Next up, I'm looking at Merck & Co. Very slightly undervalued at the moment. If Merck has a relatively good time over the next two years, we could see a 26% year-on-year return coming in. That's pretty good odds to me. It's a reasonable margin of safety. I'm going to buy some more Merck today. Where is it? There it is. Let's uh, get that up to 10 shares, shall we? Tyson Foods, I've been banging on for a long time. I knew this was going to be slow and steady growth. I think it's doing quite well today. I think this company has hit fair value now and there are risks. I think that Tyson Foods next year might see a considerable drop in value. I'll be there next year to pick it up when it goes down. Not buying today, but I think that's a very good one. So there we go. I filled my ISA to the best of my ability right now. I've still got 769 of free funds to get rid of. I'll probably start locking that in over the course of the evening. But right now I've got an account value of 22062. It's down a little bit, um, I've got to admit, but I'm probably not down as much as people who are holding straight up tech stocks or straight up YOLO stocks or SPACs. This portfolio to a point is designed to withstand little shocks in the market like this. It's supposed to save as much value as possible. And weirdly, it seems to be kind of working. I think in general, most companies out there are overvalued right now. And I don't think I'm ever going to be able to convince anyone of that. All I'm going to do is keep at it with my thing. I'm just going to keep watching value. I'm going to try and find good, stable companies that pay a dividend and see if that can help me compound going on into the future. And next week, I'm going to do a full breakdown of what I think dividend investing is all about. Finally, and this is stupid and taking ever, I want to look at Bitcoin and Ethereum because I do YOLO a little bit. I believe in Bitcoin and Ethereum. I believe in Ethereum a lot more than I do Bitcoin at the moment. But Bitcoin and Ethereum, I believe, are totally stupid human behavior. And I think we're seeing it on the charts. And I must admit, wow, I didn't expect to see this today. I thought Bitcoin was really going to tank with the rest of the markets. I thought it was going to tank with Tesla. And it hasn't. It's staying right along its trend lines. It's, I'm just off a little bit there. So I'm just going to move that down there. It's all about silly human behavior. I'm just gonna draw in this trend line here because I think that's where it goes. And what I'm expecting with Bitcoin is two things. First of all, you can't predict it. You can't predict where this is going. All you can do is put areas where you think it could go. Let me take you through two scenarios. First of all, Bitcoin might, and it looks really good today, it might continue to trade along this channel. If it continues to trade along this channel, then we consider that this is in a bullish trend. So if this continues all the way up this channel, it will keep on retesting this channel until probably it gets to here. By the way, shout out to JCL Capital on Twitter. Everything I've learned about this is pretty much all down to him. I've done my own research on different things, but JCL Capital is very good with conquering the markets and I have watched him now for over a year and I must admit I've learned so much about this. I'm not ready to dive into trading. I still don't think it's a foolproof safe way of being in the markets but that's me. I need to continue learning. I either want to be able to disprove technical analysis or prove it. So if it does turn out that it's actually real I will be nicely surprised. And Bitcoin, because I believe it's one of the most human driven markets, is actually sticking quite well to technical analysis. And what I'll say with Bitcoin is eventually on one of the touches on this line, it will 
retest and then resume all the way up until this trend line at about 57 where it was at its all-time high it'll have another edge of consolidation and then it will start to fire up that's if we continue in a bullish pattern and the markets don't shit a brick in the worst case scenario we could be looking at this trend line failing if this trend line fails it will drop down to this support line which i believe is an okay support line but it's not very strong it will have a minor consolidation here but i don't think it'll hold and it'll drop all the way down to 38,000. 38,000 for me if this support doesn't hold is really the next step but that in my opinion will not be the end of the bitcoin bull run i will never sit there and go oh i think it's going to go to 100 250,000 because i just don't know but i do have a timeline i do think that in september there is going to be enough backing behind Bitcoin to eventually cause it to start its bear market. And for this, I'm looking at the R hodl ratio. This blue line is the price of Bitcoin for the past 10 years. And this red line shows the amount of trades between accounts during the peaks and troughs of the bull markets. Whenever this red line crosses into this pink shaded area, that is a good sign that the Bitcoin bull run is over. And as you can see right now, we've got plenty of time left. And it's the same with Ethereum, which in theory should outperform Bitcoin. At the moment, I haven't got a lot of technical analysis left on Ethereum. It's just this one line. And that seems to be holding right now. It's done its uh, retest and now it's resuming off. So we might see a trend line going down this way. I'm not sure yet. This is all on eToro, by the way, which I use to buy my Bitcoin. Just please, please, please remember that Bitcoin and uh, Ethereum and all the other cryptocurrencies are so volatile. You can easily lose money on Bitcoin if it's timed wrong. I'm taking this risk because I have assessed how much money I'm willing to lose in this situation. And I'm not willing to take any more risk or put any more money into cryptocurrencies right now. You would need to make that assessment of the risk yourself. Thank you very much for watching everyone. The investment app that I use is called Trading212. If you wanted to get into investing and get a free share that's worth up to £100, you can sign up for a link in the description below. I also have an affiliate link for eToro, which is where I buy my Bitcoin. You are welcome to sign up to that as well if you would like to buy cryptocurrencies or anything else. Feel free to check me out on Instagram. I nick memes from the Discord all the time and post them up. And I also do my own little bits of technical analysis and little bits of news, that sort of thing. Particularly happily with the workhorse lasagna that I made recently. And also don't forget to sign up to the completely free Discord. I am so impressed with all the chatter that's been going on in here. There is a lot of value in here. Lots of people chatting. So many people sharing lots of different hints and tips. And it's not even hypey hints and tips either. It's a lot of really good information. And there's a lot of really good businesses being dragged out of nowhere. And I really mean it. I really think this Discord is becoming really, really valuable. Thank you again for watching, guys. And if you enjoyed this video, please feel free to like, subscribe, and invest. I'm amazed how many people own stocks. I'm amazed how many people own stocks. This the sucker's going up. <laughs>